Hey, welcome back. And uh, in this module, we're going to cover fluid mechanics for process control. Uh, we're going to explain how to use fluid mechanics to make measurements and control flows. Uh, we need a basic understanding of fluid mechanics to understand how our head measurements work. This is a type of pressure measurement. And most of our flow measurements and our level measurements are based on what's called head or head pressure. Um, We'll discuss this in detail in a minute, but uh, first we're going to take a look at what is pressure and we're going to expand on what is pressure and head and weight and how they affect each other. We're going to talk about force and viscosity and how viscosity is proportional to the force and velocity to shear of fluid. We're going to talk about flow and what uh, parameters affect the flow of fluids uh, gases and liquids through pipes. Uh, then we're going to expand on uh, this flow in pumps and piping systems and we use pumps, how we use pumps to generate our head and our pressure in our pipes and accelerate our fluids through the pipes. Uh, then we're going to concentrate on how exactly is flow measurement made and so we'll look at a little bit of on how flow measurements are made and uh, then we're going to uh, take a look at CV, and CV means a couple different things. It could be the coefficient of a valve, or it could be the coefficient of a vena contracta. And so we'll talk about CV a little bit. But basically, uh, CV has to do with velocity, the velocity of the fluid as it's going through an orifice or exiting an orifice. Typically, the velocity when it's exiting the orifice as vena contracta. Okay, let's get started. Okay, here we're looking at uh, an image we used in thermodynamics, and we explained that the molecules are moving around, and uh, as they cool, they get closer and tighter together, and then as you heat them up and add more energy, they move around more and more, and as these molecules hit the side of the container or the piston on the top, uh, they generate a force, and the force divided by area is pressure. And so these molecules are doing work on the container, the vessel, the piston, the pipe system, and we'll actually measure uh, this pressure with a pressure gauge on our piping and on our tanks. But we want to expand on this and get a deeper understanding of pressure. Uh, sometimes we look at pressure as being weight. And in this case, we're looking on the right side here, we're looking at the atmosphere. And this is air, and this is a column of air going up into space, and in space is a vacuum. So in a vacuum, there are no molecules, uh, but we notice we have a whole lot of molecules at the bottom and very little molecules at the top. Well, this is because uh, they have mass of atoms, as we said, uh, that was uh, 6 times 10 to the 23 atoms per mole, and we have many molecules in a mole. And so as we generate this, as you remember, we said a mole of air is about a three-foot balloon. But what happens is all of these moles and this mass of the atoms are attracted by gravity of the Earth. And so the gravity is stronger near the Earth and not as strong in space. As a matter of fact, we practically have no gravity in space. So what happens is the gravity becomes weaker and weaker and weaker so it pulls less and less molecules. 
So the gravity pulls a lot of molecules down at the bottom near the Earth. And so we have a, a lot of mass near the Earth and very little mass out in the air. And this is important. And if we take that column and we make it one inch square by one inch, just notice one inch by one inch, and go straight up in the space, and we set that on a scale, and we measured the weight, we would have 14.7 pounds at sea level. We'll find out if we take a column of water and we make it one inch by one inch square, and we make this column 27.7 .7 inches tall, it will exert one pound of weight per square inch, and we'll discuss this in detail. Okay, so as we can see, air has weight in pounds. You know, a lot of people think, oh, air doesn't weigh enough, but that's because you're swimming in it. But if we actually weigh these molecules, they have pounds of weight, just like a gallon of milk or a gallon of water, they weigh 14.7 pounds per square inch on the surface of the earth and the surface of the ocean. So a gallon of water weighs 8.33 pounds per gallon, and that's 231 cubic inches. Okay, so if we take 231 cubic inches and we stack that up on a one by one square and we divide that 231 inch stack of water by 8.33 pounds, we get 27.7 .7 inches per pound. So that's 2.31 feet per pound of water. And this is how we measure pressure. This is our reference for most measurements. So like we were saying, people say, well, air doesn't weigh nothing. Yes, it does. That's where in thermal, we just did our mass flow measurement and we get our gases and we can actually measure the molecules and the atoms in there by pounds mass. And so they weigh pounds per square inch. And this is how we measure our pressures. So when we're looking at a liquid, uh, a liquid is basically just like a gas. Um, it's just that the molecules are more dense. So to us, it looks solid or a liquid looks more solid than air. Air, you just see right through it because the molecules are spread apart so much that you just looks like there's nothing there. Yet a liquid looks similar to a solid. It actually has a density that you can see. And, but it's still, it's just molecules, just like gas. So if we look at this hydrostatic equation graph here, um, what it is, is this could be water, and this could be water boiling. And what it is, is where you're cooler at the bottom, uh, we're liquid, and at the top, we're becoming a gas. Uh, so as we heat this and the molecules become more radical, just like in thermal, they become more radical and start bouncing around. They have a lot of space between them and they start becoming very light and then they break free as single molecules and they float in the air. And so if you look at this, it's called, it's actually a weight. And like we said, gravity is pulling down the molecules and mass times acceleration of gravity is what we call weight. And we measure it in pounds and we tend to measure it in instrumentation as pounds per a square inch pounds per square inch so as you look at this uh, you'll find out that most of our measurements for head and flow are measured in hydrostatic pressure and so that means it's heavier at the bottom uh, in this graph here than it is at the top and where if you have all the same amount of molecules they all weigh the same uh, but as we raise up you'll see that pressure one at the bottom is greater than pressure two in the middle. And so we can actually see as we raise up, we, as we spread out these molecules, they become lighter and lighter and have less pounds per square inch. Uh, that's why we don't really tell we're in air because the difference of pressure between your feet and your head is so small, you don't feel it pushing down on you. But if you're in a pool, uh, even there, it's a little heavier, but you still don't really feel that much pressure pushing down on you uh, a little bit more. Let's look at this higher static equation graph one more time. Uh, you can actually see the difference in temperatures in these three layers. From the bottom up to P1 would be cool. And say that was normal water. And normally our reference would be 60 degrees Fahrenheit 
and atmospheric pressure. Sometimes it could be 68 degrees, so be sure to check your calculation. But usually it's 60 degrees Fahrenheit and atmospheric pressure of 14.7. And so if we go a little higher, we'll see that it's lighter. And that may be a specific gravity of 0.98. And then if we went to the top, it's almost steam, and it may be a specific gravity of 0.92. And specific gravity just says uh, how heavy and how many molecules per square uh, foot is there. Uh, typically, we do our specific volume as volume per mass, and we do our density mass per volume. So when we say there's 62.4 pounds per cubic foot of water, that's our density. If we took the reciprocal of that, that would be our volume per mass, or specific volume. And if we take our density, in this case, uh, we can do it in gallons, liters, cubic meters. Uh, we can do it in cubic feet. And so we'll typically take the weight of water for one cubic foot, and if we divide it by our reference of a cubic foot of water at 60 degrees, uh, of course it's going to be lighter. And the ratio of this weight per cubic foot is called specific gravity. If we took another um, fluid, say oil, and we measured its weight per cubic foot per cubic foot of water, that would be the specific gravity, which would be about 0.85. If we took alcohol and we measured a cubic foot of alcohol per cubic foot of water, uh, that would be about 0.78 and that's its specific gravity. So as you see, as the molecules get lighter and spread out more, and there's less molecules per cubic foot, the specific gravity becomes less. Okay, um, we'll look at how pressure comes from density and acceleration of gravity in a minute, but a quick note is, uh, take a gallon of water and hold it up, and you can feel the 8.33 pounds per gallon, and it doesn't feel that heavy, but drop it on your foot, and it's actually very heavy. Uh, you can actually feel a lot more force. That's because you raised it in the air, and as it falls, it accelerates, and mass times acceleration equals force. So when you raise something up, and you let go of it, and it falls, it accelerates and does work. It does work in pounds and foot-pounds of force. Because uh, when we do work over distance, it's when we have force over distance, it's work. So when we raise our water up into a column, even though it's falling all the time, it's doing work. And we can measure that work. And that work will actually be the force over distance that accelerates our fluids. And so the heavier the water is, the more dense it is, the more work it can do. So water can do more work than alcohol because it's heavier. So like we said, pick up the jug of milk, drop it on your foot, and you can feel it. Get a styrofoam ball the same size and drop it, and you hardly feel it because the lighter the material, the less work it does over distance. So we should understand that a column of alcohol or a column of oil can't do the same work as a column of water. And that's because the water is heavier, the alcohol and the oil is lighter. And even though it's the same height, with the same acceleration of gravity, there's less mass, so it generates less force and can do less work. And this is a very important point when we come to flow measurement. We have to understand that everything we do is based on a column of water and the force of a column of water. So if we're using alcohol, we have to increase the height to add more mass to generate the same force as water. Okay, let's take a look at the uh, liquid pressure formula. We see that pressure equals the Greek lowercase p rho times h times g. Well, rho is our density of our liquid. Like we said, for water it would be 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. And G is acceleration of gravity, which for us will be 32.2 uh, feet per second squared, uh, 9.81 if we're in metric units. Um, but we're going to deal with English units in almost everything we do, because even though the test is metric SI units and English units, 
most every problem is done as English, so I'm going to concentrate on the English uh, Imperial Standard Unit. Okay, so we see pressure equals rho hg, and the pressure is at the bottom. And again, we got mass some acceleration is weight, and as we stack these weights, uh, say a cubic foot of water on top of a cubic foot of water on top of a cubic foot of water, it's just common sense that it's going to get heavier. And so since the weight is heavier, that means we're generating more force. Now, a lot of people are confused because they think a really big tank has more force than a little tank. But if you look at these pictures, you'll see no matter what the shape is, they have the same pressure. How do we know they have the same pressure and weight? Water seeks its own level, and you notice they're all the same level. So it doesn't matter what the shape is of the tank. We're just looking at one square inch of water extending down in a column and pushing on the bottom, and that is our pound per square inch. So no matter how big the column or how small, we reference it to one square inch. Even if the hole is an eighth inch round, we measure our, our pressure over one square inch reference. Okay, so what does the liquid pressure formula tell us? What does it actually mean? Well, if we look at this lower left, we'll see that the volume equals the height times the area, and that weight equals mass times acceleration. Now, it's very important that you understand that gravity is always accelerating the water downwards. Even if it's not moving, it's doing work because it's being accelerated at 32 feet per second. And so it's constantly pushing a force against something, and we call this potential energy. Uh, when it starts moving, we call it kinetic energy. And both of these can do work. Potential is the ability to do work, while kinetic is the act of actually doing the work. We'll talk about that in a minute. But let's look at the formula here. Pressure equals weight divided by area, or force divided by area. And we said that force and weight are the same thing. So force equals mass times acceleration of gravity divided by area. Force divided by area is pressure. But mass per volume is density. And we typically, we talk about the density of a fluid as 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. So we can substitute uh, mass divided by volume as rho and multiply the top times the volume. That's the same as saying mass divided by volume times volume and volume over volume is one. So our equation doesn't change. And we remove the mass divided by V and put in rho. So we get rho times volume times G over area. Well, we notice that volume is area times height. Therefore, we can just divide the area over area as one, and we just drop that out of the equation, and we're left with rho, the density in mass per cubic feet times acceleration of gravity times the height equals pressure. So the liquid pressure formula is stated as density times acceleration of gravity times height, or in other words, mass per volume times acceleration of gravity per height will equal our pressure from the weight of the water or fluids we stack up. So we said it does work. Why does it do work? Let's look at the upper right equation. Force divided by area equals pressure. Well, if we multiply force over distance, which does work, and if we multiply the area times distance, uh, distance over distance is one. Our formula hasn't changed. But we see that area times distance is volume, and force times distance equals work. Therefore, we have work or energy per volume. That's why the more water we have, the more work it can do. So remember, pressure equals energy divided by volume. And pressure is doing work per volume. So the first foot at the top, you have 62.4 pounds. The second foot down, you have 2 times 62.4 pounds. Uh, the third foot down, you have 3 times 62.4 pounds. And the fourth one down, you have 4 times 62.4 pounds. So you can see we're integrating this weight 
uh, which is integrating the force, which integrates how much work we can do. And remember, the molecules are pounding against the side, uh, but they're also being pulled down by the acceleration of gravity. And this is pushing out. So our weight integrates or adds up as we go down. So there's not as much pressure on the top of the tank as there is on the bottom of the tank. And we have to make sure that our tank can withstand the pressure or the weight of the water. Otherwise, it could bust out the bottom or crack a weld. Uh, a fixture like a valve may pop loose or an instrument may pop loose if it can't withstand the pressure. Now, don't forget, it's not just the weight of the water, but in some of these tanks, they're pressurized. And so you may have a pressure coming in there that's above the water, maybe 100 PSI above the weight of the water. So the weight of the water doesn't even matter compared to the pressure. And we have to make sure we can withstand this pressure. Now, when you're working with instrumentation, you'll probably hear the term head more than pressure or head pressure. And we talk about head. So what is head? Well, it's, it's a term that was made up a long time ago, uh, we believe, from uh, the amount of pressure that a dam exerts on a turbine to generate electricity. Um, it has nothing to do with Navy. Uh, but anyway, we said that the pressure is proportional to rho times acceleration of gravity times the height. So we know from our height, we can correlate directly the pressure that a column of water is applying. Like we said, 27.7 inches of water equals one PSI of pressure. In other words, one pound of weight per square inch of work. And so the pump is doing work and the water flowing through instruments are doing work. Uh, just like you're putting a current through a resistor, when you're going through an orifice, you have to do work. And that's the uh, amount of energy per resistance as you go through and it dissipates that energy. Well, how do we get this energy into our water? With a pump. We take electricity, put it into a motor, and it's in kilowatts of work or horsepower of work, which is 36,000 foot-pounds per minute. And uh, so that energy is transferred into a turbine that's spinning a vane, these little, uh, basically like a, a little air propeller, uh, and this little propeller is spinning in there, and these vanes accelerate the water. And as they accelerate it out, they cause a low pressure in the center. As you leave, you're leaving a vacuum, an empty space, so the pressure inside the center of the pump drops, and so it actually suck in the water, and that's how we suck the water in. Now, remember, as you cause this vacuum, there is no pressure there. Therefore, the pressure outside, the weight of the water, or if it's below the pump, it's the force of the air that forces that water up in there because the air is 14.7 PSI. So with 14.7 PSI, that would be 33.9 feet of a column of water. And so it's just like having a column of water that's tall pushing down and trying to push it up in there. In other words, the air is doing work on the water and forces it up into the pump since there's no resistance because there's a vacuum, there's no molecules. So it tries to push those molecules into the pump. And that's how the pump starts circulating the water. The whole purpose of the pump is to generate a column of water to do work. And this column of water it generates, whether it be 50 foot, 60 foot, 300 foot, or 600 foot, is called the head. And even if we say it has 600 foot of water, that means that if you put a pipe 600 foot up, it would raise the water up to 600 foot, and right at 600 foot, it would stop raising the water. That's all the work it can do. Uh, we know that when we lift the ball up in the air or we lift a block up in the air or a gallon of milk up in the air, it's heavy. You have to do work. If you lift a weight a long time, that's what they're doing with weights. You're lifting the weight to do work. And so you have to do work to lift. Well, when we do that and we lift it up, now it has potential energy. It has the potential to do work. Just like if you drop the gallon of milk or the weight on your foot, it hurts because it's doing a lot of work. So the higher we lift it, the more work it can do. And as it falls, 
that's the kinetic energy. And when it hits, it applies a higher pressure, and this it applies a force against it to accelerate whatever mass is trying to accelerate whatever mass uh, it hits. Uh, when it comes in contact, remember that per Newton's laws of motion, uh, once in motion, it tends to stay in motion until acted on by an external force. And from inertia, we know that it'll transfer its energy from one body to another. So the water is constantly being accelerated up into the air by the pump, and gravity is constantly trying to accelerate it down. And to hold it still, that means the forces have to cancel out. So the pump has to generate as much force as gravity is pulling it down. So this force going downward, uh, when we open a valve, it'll start flowing because we have force and it starts falling. Uh, and as it starts falling, the force divided by the mass equals the acceleration. So it starts accelerating the fluid through the pipe, the valves, the orifices. So the pump raises the water up and the gravity pulls it back down. And then the pump raises the water up and the gravity pulls it back down. And so it just keeps doing this, but it does it in real time. So as quick as you can accelerate it up with the pump, gravity is pulling it back down. And so the water is falling through the pipe and falling through the piping system. And this is what's happening in flow measurement. Uh, when we use an orifice and put a differential pressure transmitter across this orifice, we're measuring the difference of a water column the height of the water. And this height is proportional to the work it's doing. In other words, it's the static pressure of the water. And the total energy in the water is the static plus the kinetic. So the difference of the static, we had to change static, potential energy, into kinetic energy to go through the resistor. And so this difference of the height of the columns or the difference of the static pressure on the upstream and the downstream is proportional to the work we're doing. And we know that work is force over distance, so our pressure comes from force. Rather than talking about pressure, start thinking about it as force. Uh, force equals mass times acceleration. So we're accelerating the mass through the small orifice, the hole, small hole, the resistor, and we're doing work, and that flow rate is proportional to the work of force times distance, so mass times acceleration, and so the difference of our static pressure tells us how much work we're doing or how many pounds, since our work is in foot pounds, how many pounds of mass is flowing through there, essentially. So you say, um, well, the transmitter only measures pressure and it measures differential pressure. So if you look at this diagram of the transmitter, you'll see there's some little diaphragms down at the bottom. And these diaphragms are connected to a sensor, typically capacitance, and it changes capacitance. Well, we have to do work and apply a force to deflect those diaphragms, and that compresses the fluid above it. Well, we're measuring pressure, and those are calibrated in pounds per square inch for those diaphragms. So you say, well, if you're going to call in the water, you're losing work. Uh, you said it's lighter at the top than it was at the bottom. Well, Pascal's law of hydraulics says that in a closed system uh, that's pressurized, the pressure is the same everywhere in the closed system. So if we follow this tube from the transmitter down into the pressure pipe, the process pipe, that's a closed system. Now it's divided by a, a work drop or a pressure drop across the orifice and on the other side of the orifice uh, we know that it has less pressure because it's done work and so that in itself on that side with that pipe is a closed system itself. So each one has the same pressure that's in the process pipe uh, transmitted up to the diaphragms. And so we have a, a difference of pressure, and therefore we call this a differential pressure transmitter, making a differential pressure measurement. Now, in, in process piping, we'll understand that as the pump uh, varies speed, or as a control valve opens and closes, uh, our pressure changes per our flow rate. If our flow rate goes down, our pressure increases. If our flow rate increases, the pressure goes down. That's because we're changing from kinetic to potential or potential to kinetic. So if we want to speed up, we have to change potential to kinetic, which means our pressure will fall. 
And if we want to slow down, that means we have to change kinetic into potential, which means our static pressure increases. So what you got to understand is these columns of water going into these transmitters are constantly falling through the pipe and the pump is accelerating it back up into the column. And so these columns vary up and down with your flow rate and pulsations of the pump. Uh, a transmitter will actually have pulsations, and this is where some of the noise in the transmitter comes from because of the pump pulsations. Uh, we'll talk about how this works in process pipes after the break. First, I want to stop and talk about gauges and pressure gauges and how we use these pressure gauges. Because the way these pressure gauges measure are basically how our transmitters work. These transmitters are basically electronic pressure gauges that transmit that pressure measurement. So let's talk about that now. So as you remember, that pressure is caused by the molecules uh, pounding against something, pushing against something. They're, they're vibrating around, moving around, randomly accelerating at a velocity, and they hit something and deaccelerate and bounce off. And when they bounce off, they transfer their energy, and that energy is called pressure. That's force divided by area is pressure. Uh, so we basically have um, three type of pressure gauges or pressure measurements done by transmitters. We have absolute pressure, a gauge pressure, and a differential pressure. So atmospheric pressure is from a vacuum where there are no molecules. A complete vacuum has no molecules. Therefore, there's no energy. There's no temperature. There's no molecules moving around vibrating and colliding and generating friction and heat, uh, it doesn't exist. Uh, so a complete vacuum is void of molecules. And so we add molecules, we come up to atmospheric pressure, which we know is 14.7. So our atmosphere at sea level is 14.7. Then anything above that atmospheric pressure, we call gauge pressure. So gauge pressure, PSIG, means that it's a pressure above the atmosphere, while absolute pressure, PSIA, means it's the pressure measured above a vacuum. Uh, so it's the atmospheric pressure and the gauge pressure put together, and that's the absolute pressure. So differential pressure is PSID, and it's just what it says. It is the difference between one pressure and another pressure. Uh, just like we were going up the stack and you saw earlier, the difference in molecules is the differential pressure. So by now you should see, uh, we just add the letter onto the end of the PSI to say what type of pressure measurement is, absolute, gauge, or differential. Okay, let's take a break and we'll come back and we'll talk about some, uh, kinetic energy, potential energy, piping systems, and we'll expand on this subject until we understand what's going on for instrumentation. Um, this will probably be about an hour and a half module time we're finished, but it's very valuable. It's worth it. We'll talk about pressure and how to make a differential pressure measurement. And we'll talk a little bit about the physics involved with making these measurements and what the formulas look like and what formulas we'll use. Uh, so our next module is instrumentation, and that's where we'll be starting. Okay, uh, so let's take a break. Do some review if you want and then we'll get started again. Now, on the exam, the CSE and the CCST, you're going to have questions about velocities of flows in pipe, uh, differential pressure across orifices, and differential pressure across pipes. Now, the CAP's probably not going to have any of these questions. They're pretty much concentrate on uh, management, software, documentation control, and advanced process control. Uh, there may be a question, but probably not. But on the CSE and the CCST, we'll definitely have these questions. So let's talk a little bit about uh, kinetic and potential energy and how this works in pipes and orifices for pressure drop for a few minutes. And then we'll get into calculating these equations. They're pretty simple um, and be very valuable in the exam. Okay, um, the difference between flow rate and pressure is a little confusing. Uh, and we're going to talk about kinetic energy and potential energy. Uh, so if we look at this um, roller coaster, say this is our pipe system. Uh, at first, our kinetic energy is zero and our potential energy is 100%. That means that we have this, what they call deadheaded, or the valve is closed. 
and the pump is generating all the pressure it can generate, trying to build up this column of water up into the air. So it's not flowing anywhere yet. But then as we open up the valve and it starts flowing down the pipe, uh, we have 50% kinetic and 50% potential. Uh, that's because some of the potential energy has to change into kinetic energy to allow it to flow through the pipe. It's what's accelerating it through the pipe and carrying energy. Now, uh, say we open this valve up a whole lot. Uh, it's practically all kinetic energy and very little pressure. So if you look up here at the low pressure hand, you'll see uh, it's just kind of coming out. It, it's flowing. I mean, there's a lot of flow rate there. You can see the density of the water is flowing, but it's dropping off very quickly because there's very little pressure. Okay. Say we increase the pressure by putting our thumb over the hose on the high pressure. So if you look at this, you'll see that the kinetic energy decreases to 75 while the potential energy increases to 25. The roller coaster is our potential energy or our pressure that is the driving force to accelerate the water. We increase the back pressure, and this is increasing the back pressure on the piping system in the pump. And when we that gives us high pressure in our line and since we have more pressure we have more energy and so it accelerates the water even more and this is very confusing it's hard to see um, as we use our our control valve we'll notice that uh, if we build a system curve we'll notice we need less pressure on low flow and more pressure on high flow so on low flow you have less pressure and that's because the pump will only see the back pressure or the resistance of the valve in the piping system. So with a low flow system, we need a small pump, uh, low flow and low back pressure via a lower system curve. And with a high flow rate, we need a bigger pump to put more energy into the water because you're moving more water. So it takes more energy. It takes more work. And um, so... But when we get into a process plant, typically we put in a control valve into our piping system and we put a large pump that does a lot of work. And so if we want to go slow with a low flow rate, we close down this valve. And this valve offers a very high resistance, so we drop most of the work of the pump across the valve. It's doing a lot of work on the valve instead of the water, so the water slows down and deaccelerates because it has less pressure on the other side of the valve. With less pressure, that means we got less force and pressure times area is force. So force divided by mass equals acceleration. So we deaccelerate the water by dropping all this pressure or doing all this work on the valve. Remember your pressure is work per volume. So we open the valve up, it has very little resistance. We're doing very little work so our pressure increases on the other side of the valve downstream. And since we have a higher differential pressure, pressure times area is force, we got a greater differential force. And so force divided by mass acceleration, and the water really starts accelerating. So by now you should have an understanding of how pressure uh, affects the flow rate. The potential pressure will, if you got a low potential pressure, you got a low flow rate. If you got a high potential pressure, you got a high flow rate. Okay, but remember, this is total energy in the system, potential plus kinetic. So when we speed up, even though we've increased our pressure and the water starts flowing, uh, the potential measured in the piping system will change into kinetic. So the potential will drop as it speeds up. And that's where it looks like you have low pressure with high flow and high pressure with low flow. That's because we put more pressure on the valve to slow it down and less pressure on the valve to speed it up. That way, again, the potential will change into kinetic uh, as we carry this water through there. It has to do work to overcome the resistance of the pipe. Uh, this pipe is a big resistor, so it has to give up energy as it goes down the pipe. And as it goes down the pipe, we're constantly giving up energy and giving up energy and giving up energy. But mass in equals mass out, so we maintain our flow rate. 
later on when we're doing our pump calculations, we'll see that uh, in this piping system, at the faster the fluid flows, the more resistance it offers. And this is due to the kinetic energy loss and the viscosity of the fluid. Uh, it takes force to shear this fluid and make it move. Uh, the fluid is trying to actually make a molecular bond to the sides of the wall and to each other. And as we force it down through there, it starts shearing. And uh, it takes a certain amount of energy to make it shear. We actually have turbulent flow for most flows. It's very turbulent, not laminar at all. And we want a good turbulent flow for temperature measurement, as a matter of fact, uh, because it's mixed up and it gives you a more average of the temperature. Uh, it's good for pressure measurement because we get a more average of the pressure flowing through the pipe. Otherwise, the velocity would be higher in the middle than it is on the outsides. So our viscosity has to do with how much force we apply. It has to do with the velocity and the force that makes it shear. Uh, we're not going to talk about this much more. Uh, we just want to be familiar with what viscosity is. Uh, you can get you a fluid book if you want to learn more about viscosity. Okay, if you look at this uh, graph on the left here, you'll see energy gradient and you'll see hydraulic gradient. And in between these two lines, you'll see velocity head and velocity head is the kinetic energy like we said the faster you go the more resistance this pipe offers to the flow of fluid and we have to give up kinetic energy on these losses and this kinetic energy is typically called the velocity head while the pressure drop is called the pressure head so remember the velocity head plus the pressure head equals the total head of the pump and that's the total energy the pump's putting into the system to do the work. The energy that's left in the system as it drops off is considered the energy gradient. That is how much energy is left from what you initially put in with the pump as it goes down the line. So as we go down the pipe, the potential energy drops and the kinetic energy drops a little bit until you get to the end of the pipe. And there's no energy left, uh, except for the exception of where we talked about in thermal. Uh, if we have pressure in a tank, we have to have enough energy left over to overcome that pressure in the tank and allow it to flow out. Okay, so this is what confuses some people on the exam. Uh, intuitively, you would think that if you got a high flow, you would have a high pressure. And if you got a low flow, you got a low pressure. But these are just the opposite. And so the remember the formula is pressure one times flow one squared equals pressure two times flow two squared therefore pressure two equals pressure one times flow one over flow two squared so these are inverse so the pressures are inverse to the flow rate and so looking at the formula you can see that if you speed up the flow rate the pressure will drop and if you slow down the flow rate the pressure will increase and as we explained just remember the potential and the kinetic that potential has to change the kinetic go faster and when you slow down the kinetic has to change back into potential because we have total energy in the system so that's the potential plus the kinetic plus the work being done which is the Bernoulli equation okay Let's calculate some. So let's look at this and see how this works. Um, first, we're going to calculate uh, what the pressure drop is, ratios as far as uh, one flow rate compared to another flow rate, and what the differential pressure is across the orifice compared to uh, one flow rate and another flow rate. We're going to look at how to get the velocity out of gas and liquids through a pipe. Uh, these are your typical questions on the exam. And then we'll discuss in detail uh, what these pressure drops are in the piping system because as an engineer, you may want to size a small piping system or pumping system. On a note, uh, if you want to learn more about pumps and sizing pumps and a little bit about valves and sizing valves and hydronic systems, uh, Bell and Gossett has a school in Chicago, Illinois, called the Little Red Schoolhouse, and it's a one-week course. 
and it's a really good course. I took it myself. Uh, it lasts one week, and it's absolutely free. So you may be interested in seeing that. Uh, it's called the Hydronics Pump Application and Design Seminar, and it'll teach you how to size pumps and how to design a piping system. Okay, let's do some problems from the exam. Um, uh, here we have a process pipe. And as you can see, it doesn't matter what the orientation is, if it's vertical or if it's horizontal, uh, we got a flow going through this. And uh, we have a valve connected to the pipe, and then that's connected to what's called the impulse piping. And that would be where the fluid goes to the pressure gauge. And we see a pressure gauge on the end. And we always want to put a valve on the process pipe so if the pressure gauge breaks, uh, we can replace it, or if we need to calibrate the pressure gauge, they can be calibrated. Uh, we can remove it, take it to the shop, and calibrate it. But anyway, we're looking at our formula here for static pressure in a pipe with flow change. And that's P1 times flow 1 squared equals P2 times flow 2 squared. Therefore, P2 equals F1 over F2 squared times P1. And so for our test right here, we're going to say we have 100 gallons a minute flowing through a pipe and the pressure gauge is showing uh, 40 PSI. Now this is the static pressure. So the static pressure is showing 40 PSI. And then if we slow this flow down to 80 gallons per minute, what will the pressure gauge show? And if we speed the flow up to 120 gallons a minute, what will the pressure gauge show? So first we'll slow it down. So as you see, you've got F1 and P1 is your initial condition. That's the original condition. And F2 and P2 will be the condition after we change the flow rate. So we'll take 100 gallons a minute, our initial condition, and we'll divide it by 80. That's when we slow it down. We square that. So that's 1.25 squared equals 1.5625. Then we multiply that multiplier times 40 PSI, and we get our pressure is 62.5 PSI when we're flowing at 80 gallons a minute. So we see our pressure did increase when we slow our flow rate down. Now let's speed it up from 100 gallons a minute to 120 gallons a minute. So again, our initial condition is 100 gallons per minute at 40 PSI. So F1 would be 100 and F2 would be 120. We divide these and we get 0 0.8333. We square that and we get 0 0.6944. And then we multiply that times our 40 PSI, and we get 27.78 PSI on our gauge. So we can see as we speed up, the static pressure decreases just as we said. Okay, let's look at an orifice now and how our pressure, and in this case, our pressure will be called differential pressure, and we call it H for head. And we're going to look at how it changes with the change in flow rate. Now, it's important to understand that uh, the pressure gauge on the impulse piping, uh, it doesn't matter if it's liquid or gas. It's just a head pressure. So we can measure it in feet or PSI and they're interchangeable. But when we get into our flow measurement, uh, we're going to find out we have to use the specific gravity of the fluid to get an accurate measurement. So let's do this now. So like we said earlier, we put a restriction in the pipe and we do work across that restriction and that the static pressure on each side of the restriction is proportional to the work we're doing and which is proportional to our flow rate of our mass through it. So uh, we're looking at this um, Venturi right here which is the same as an orifice that has a, a small circle in the center. And when we do these calculations, it's important to keep the inside diameter of the pipe exact as you can and keep your orifice as exact as you can with the beta ratio. So as you remember, beta ratio is 
the inside diameter of the restriction compared or over the inside diameter of the piping system. So let's look at our formula for pressure across the orifice with the flow change. It's just like the other formula except the flows are reversed. So that's H1 times flow 2 squared equals H2 times flow 1 squared. Okay, let's do a calculation. Uh, our initial conditions, 100 gallons a minute again. And our orifice uh, produces a differential pressure that is equal to 142.95 inches of water. Remember, our, we measure our water column, 27.7 uh, inches equals 1 psi. But since it's so small, we measure in inches. And like we said, our orifice uh, ratio for this one will be 0 0.5. It's half the diameter for the restriction. And we want to know what's our head pressure, uh, our differential head pressure, at the new flow condition of 80 gallons a minute. So we take our initial conditions on the bottom, 100. Our new condition flow rate is on the top. So it becomes 80 gallons a minute over 100 gallons a minute times 142.95 inches of water equals our new head, head 2. So this becomes 0.8 squared times 142.95 and 0.8 squared equals 0.64 times 142.95 inches of water gives us 91.49 inches H2O. So it doesn't matter if we say it in parentheses inches of water or if we use the inch mark and put H2O. These are exactly the same, so get used to this because they're interchangeable. One may say inches of water, one may have the inch mark and H2O after it. It's exactly the same thing. Uh, they may also call it inches water column, WC or capital WC for water column. All of these are exactly the same thing, inches of water, inches H2O, and inches water column. So notice as we slow down, the differential pressure between the two columns became less. We're coming closer to a standstill and static, so the differential pressure becomes smaller. Now let's take the initial condition of 100 gallons a minute and speed it up and see what happens to our uh, head in differential pressure of inches of water. Okay, so in this time, our initial condition is 100 gallons a minute, goes on the bottom. Our new condition is 120 gallons a minute. So we take 120 divided by 100, which is 1.2. We square that and multiply it times 1.4295 inches of water. So the 1.2 squared becomes 1.44 times 142.95 inches of water equals 205.85 inches H2O. So we can see our head became really large. It actually almost doubled here. And so as you notice is since our work is based on the flow squared, uh, the head changes as a squared function. So uh, when we're at 50% head, uh, we're actually at 70% flow. And so it just keeps increasing. If you're at 25% head, you're at 50% flow. So in the test, they may ask you to linearize the output of the flow transmitter, which is basically an electronic pressure gauge. And to linearize a flow, since the flow is squared, we simply take the square root of the differential pressure or the percent signal. And so it'll be, you take the square root of the percent of the signal. So in this case, it would be your differential pressure over the maximum calibrated inches of water in the transmitter. And then you take the square root of that. And that is your linearized signal. Uh, you can do 4 to 20 milliamps over 20 milliamps. And that also gives you the percent of the flow. Take the square root. And that will give you a linear signal and it looks more like a gain of 1 to the PLC instead of a squared function. Uh, one other important note is, notice that if we put a valve on the end of the piping system, 
uh, and we shut that valve and deadhead it, that again we have Pascal's law and the pressure is the same in anywhere in the system because it's a pressurized system where there's no flow. So when there's no flow and you're deadheaded, the pressure is the same everywhere. When you open the valve and you start flowing, that's when our static pressure starts dropping proportional to the flow uh, because we're giving up energy to overcome the resistance and push the water. When we get to uh, flow measurement and instrumentation in the other videos, uh, we'll do this in detail and we'll prove that this actually works. We'll actually calculate these flows from scratch and make sure step up through the flow rate and we'll see that these formulas actually do work and it saves a lot of math. Okay, uh, let's look at velocity through pipes because you're going to have some questions on the test about if you have a velocity of one pipe and it changes to another size pipe, uh, what will that velocity be? Or if I've got a flow rate in gallons per minute or standard cubic feet, what is my velocity through the pipe? Um, this velocity is kind of important because uh, when we get a high velocity, our pipes start vibrating and generating noise. Going, mm. And so we try to keep, we have uh, standards that have been set up by people, uh, recommendations, not really standards, uh, of what your flow rate should be. Uh, in other words, if you're trying to transfer heat like we talked about in thermal uh, and we're trying to use a heat exchanger, uh, first of all, we're going from a big pipe to a bunch of small pipes, so we don't want our velocity too high. It'll vibrate these pipes and crack the weld. Uh, the other thing is when we go slower, it's much easier to transfer the energy from one fluid to another fluid at a lower flow rate. It's easier to absorb that energy and heat. Okay, we're looking at this uh, piece of process piping here at the bottom. So we have a two inch main pipe that's reduced down to a one inch pipe to increase the velocity. And so we want to know what is the velocity through this schedule 40 one inch if our velocity through the two inch is 10 feet a second. Well, we'll look at the continuity equation and we'll see that uh, we can take our area and change that into pi divided by four times diameter squared and so they equal each side or they're both the same and so pi divided by 4 becomes 0.7854 times diameter squared and when we divide side 2 under side 1 uh, leaving velocity 2 there we get that it's the ratio of our area 1 over area 2 times velocity 1 equals velocity 2 well the 0.7854 or the pi divided by 4 just cancels out and you're left with diameter 1 squared over diameter 2 squared therefore it just becomes diameter 1 over diameter 2 and then we square the results multiply that times velocity 1 10 feet a second and we get 40 feet a second so the 1 inch pipe the velocity will increase to 40 feet a second so on the exam you may have a question about uh, you have so many gallons a minute or so many standard cubic feet a minute flowing through a pipe at a velocity in feet per second. What size is the pipe? Or they may say we have uh, a liquid in gallons per minute or we have a, a gas or a vapor in standard cubic feet per minute uh, flowing through a certain size pipe. What is its velocity? So let's look at that. So say if we had 400 gallons a minute uh, flowing through a pipe at 10 feet a second, that would be a 4-inch pipe. And if we looked at it the other way, if we had a 4-inch pipe with 400 gallons a minute flowing through it, we'd be flowing at approximately 10 feet a second. So let's see how to calculate this for the exam. Okay, the question is, uh, we have 400 gallons a minute in a 4-inch pipe what is the velocity of the fluid through the pipe and we need to prove that it's 10 feet a second so if you get this question first thing you do is uh, your gallons per minute equals volume per minute which is length times area per minute so step two will be change volume per minute into volume per second so that's length times area per minute 
times 1 minute or 60 seconds changes it to volume per second. Step 3. Uh, our volume. What is our volume? Well, that's gallons per minute times 231 cubic inches per gallon equals 400 times 231 cubic inches, which equals 92,400 cubic inches. Okay, step four is length equals volume by area. So if we divide our volume by area, we'll get our length. So we'll take 92,400 cubic inches, divide that by our area, 0.7854 times the 4 inch diameter squared gives us 7,352.94 inches in length. So, step five, length per second. What is our length per second? That's what we're trying to find out. So, that would be 7,352.94 inches per minute times one foot over 12 inches changes us into feet times one minute over 60 seconds. So, the inches cancel out, the minutes cancel out. We're left with feet per second, and our solution is. 10.21 feet per second. Once well, they're going through all this work, we've already devised a formula for you, and taking all these calculations, combining them into a number, we can break this down into velocity in feet per second equals GPM, gallons per minute, times 0 0.4085 divided by the diameter of the pipe in inches squared. And so your velocity equals 400 times 0 0.4085 divided by 16 gives you 10.21 feet per second. So the book has uh, the formulas you need to do this uh, that you can take into the exam and look these formulas up very easily. Um, the difference between gallons per minute and liquid and actual cubic feet per minute and gas and vapor is just the coefficient. Uh, instead of using the 0 0.4085, we use 3.0558. And this will change cubic feet a minute into uh, what we're looking for. So if we're looking for what's our pipe ID, there's our formula. If we're looking for what's its velocity, we also have the formula below. So our formula is to find the pipe diameter with the velocity of a flow known and find the flow velocity with the pipe diameter known. The book also has uh, formulas to change standard cubic feet per minute into velocity and pipe ID. Okay, um, I think we're to a breaking point where we need to take a break. Uh, you might want to review or just take a break. Uh, we'll get just a little bit more. When we come back, we're going to talk about uh, coefficients. Uh, CV. We're going to talk about the vena contracta and how an orifice works and how a valve works and what its CV is and what it means and how our pressure drop in our pipe affects this CV and the flow rate through the valve. Uh, we're going to size a quick pump uh, for a small system and then we're going to look at the process simulator and see how this actually works in a real process running and watch the levels change as it flows and see our potential energy and our kinetic energy and talk a little bit more about gauges. And that's it. So I'll see you in a little bit. Okay, let's talk about a head type flow measurement. Um, head type flow measurement uh, is complex. It um, has all different kind of formulas for what type of measurement you're making like an orifice, like you see on the left, or a venturi tube, like you see on the right. Uh, it could be a pitot tube, which is just a tube that goes down into the pipe and goes back and against the flow, and the flow accelerates up through the tube, and then you get the uh, difference of pressure by getting the static on the other side of the tube. The orifice, the dowel tube, and the venturi tube are basically based on what we're seeing here, uh, an orifice. And... Uh, so basically, you take a tank, and you put a hole in it, and the higher the head, the higher the water is in the tank, the more head it has, 
And since we have more pressure, we have the ability to do more work, so the water accelerates out faster. So the more head differential you have, in other words, the difference of the head in the tank and outside, the higher the differential, the faster it flows. The lower the differential, the slower it flows. And we basically have three terms. Uh, there's the vena contracta, and that is where when you come through this hole, the water actually kind of comes together, and then it spreads out. And this thinnest part is called the vena contracta. And in there is what we call the CV, the coefficient of velocity as it exits out. And so we take our coefficient of velocity, which is proportional to the square root of 2g height. Okay. Then we have the coefficient of contraction. And this coefficient of contraction is the area of the vena contracta over the area of the orifice. And we take our CV times our coefficient, and this is called coefficient of contraction. We take our coefficient of contraction times our coefficient of velocity, and we get C sub D, which is coefficient of discharge. And these formulas become kind of complex, but in the exams, uh, we're going to use what's called the Spinks equation. Some will use an ISO equation to measure flow. But in our exam, we're going to use what's called the Spinks equation. And Mr. Spinks has spent a lifetime studying this. And he's taken all these different coefficients and put them into, based on the beta ratio of the inside diameter of the orifice compared to the outside diameter of the pipe, uh, he has a number. And it's called the Spinks factor. So you just look up the beta ratio of smallest diameter over large diameter. And you get the Spinks factor, you plug it into the formula, whether it be an orifice plate, a Dow tube, or a Venturi tube, and then you look it up as what the taps are. Now these taps can be what they call corner taps, radius taps, pipe taps, diameter taps, and these are all different distances. And we'll cover these taps when we get into flow measurement and show how this works. But we'll just take the Spinks factor, we'll plug it into our formula, and we get that our gallons per minute equals 5.667 times the S factor, the Spinks factor, times your inside pipe diameter squared, times the square root of the difference of head pressure over the Pacific gravity. Okay, if we look at the image on the left, this is called a k-value for coefficients. And if you're using classical fluid mechanics to calculate your flow, uh, you'll use the k-value. And essentially, q equals a v k. And when you're finished doing all your calculations, you break it down, you'll get q equals 5.667 times k times the diameter squared times the square root of your head or your specific gravity. It's almost the same as the Spinks factor. Uh, it's not as accurate, though. Uh, the Spinks factor takes in many, many variables. Um, and then on the right side right here, we're seeing the ISO 5167 equation. And as you can see, it becomes kind of complex. It's much more work. And in the book, I do all three of these equations and compare them. And you'll see that there is not much difference between the ISO and the Sphinx. They are so minute in, in differences that it's hardly worth doing all the work to do the ISO unless you got a computer. Let's talk a little bit about uh, what exactly is happening in this uh, head measurement devices with the fluid mechanics real quick. And then we'll talk about another CV. And this will be the CV on the exam. And it's the coefficient of the valve. So we'll explain that in a minute. But first, let's look at this. This is important. When we come into our uh, measurement device, we have a certain amount of head and a velocity. And due to the equation of continuity, we know that we have to accelerate when we go through a smaller pipe because mass in equals mass out. So the same mass has to flow. So obviously, it has to accelerate. And then from thermodynamics, we know that uh, when our velocity increases, our pressure drops. So in the vena contracta, we have a pressure drop. And we do work, and some of this pressure is lost, but some of it is recovered. 
So as you can see, the velocity again slows back down and the pressure rises again. We have potential becomes kinetic, so the pressure drops at the vena contracta. And then as we slow down, the kinetic comes back into potential energy. And the kinetic drops down a little bit because we slowed down. Also notice the pressure is less exiting than when it came in. That's because we did work and so we lost energy. Uh, that pressure was given up to do the work through the orifice or the restriction. Okay, now an in instrumentation. You hear someone talk about the CV. Typically it's C sub V of the valve. And I'll show that as a C V or a C with a small case V following. And this CV of the valve, um, and you're typically going to see it as C small v, this CV of the valve stands for coefficient of valve. And what CV stands for is it says if we maintain one PSI of differential pressure across the valve and it passes one gallon of water per minute, that is one CV. So if you had 10 gallons of water passing it per minute, that would be 10 CV. If you have 100 gallons of water passing through in one minute, that would be 100 CV. And this is with one PSI differential. And the PSI differential never varies. So when you're looking at your valves, and people make this mistake, they'll look at the CV on a, a, in a book, and they'll say, well, I can use all this CV and I can open my valve 100%. That doesn't work. Um, you need to have a certain amount of differential pressure across the valve to make it work. And as we know, our pressure is dropping in the pipe on high flows and it's increasing on low flows. So uh, we can get, as we slow down and we close the valve down, we get a greater differential pressure. So even though it's uh, closing the valve down, it's still trying to speed up the water because the pressure is increasing and that's giving us more CV. But as we try to increase the flow and the valve opens up and the water starts flowing, the pressure drops. And so the CV also drops with that pressure. So this curve you'll see from the factory, uh, it's called the inherent characteristics from the plant. And when it's installed, it's called the installed characteristics. And these curves tend to flatten out. Instead of going up as a squared function, it'll flatten out and become more linear because we lose pressure. Therefore, we lose CV as we speed up. There's also a, a maximum allowable delta P across the valve. You can only have so much differential pressure across this valve. And if you see this differential pressure with uh, a gas, you'll choke. And with a liquid, you'll cavitate. If you look at this chart, you'll see that this looks like it's uh, growing in flow, but actually it's growing in differential pressure towards the maximum allowable differential pressure. And this maximum allowable differential pressure will tell us when we're going to choke or cavitate. And we can calculate this and find out what is our allowable differential pressure. Uh, we can't just add all the differential pressure we want. Uh, it may cavitate. And it's going to kind of cavitate towards the bottom of your curve, of your valve curve. Uh, down at the bottom of the valve curve is where we said the maximum differential pressure exists because the valve is closing down and you're developing that differential pressure across the valve. So in a minute, we'll talk about um, cavitation and choking and show what happens when the valve is flashing and when the valve is cavitating. But let's talk a little more about what's happening with this delta P chart they tend to choke, what they call choking, uh, about 75 to 80%. And this is you actually reach a, a terminal differential pressure, which sets a terminal velocity, and we just can't flow any faster than that. doesn't matter if you open the valve up more. Uh, it's just not going to flow anymore. That's just all the mass you can get through the vena contracta. The vena contracta has contracted and became smaller, and we have to get that all that mass through there. And for the amount of energy you're applying, uh, you just can't get any more mass. It's like trying to push people through a door. You can only push so many people through the door, and you just can't go any faster. 
And if you try to increase the pressure, what it does, it causes cavitation and it causes flashing. Uh, and this cavitation and flashing is due to a high differential pressure. And if we have a high differential pressure across the valve, as we flow through the orifice of the valve, we know we accelerate, we know the pressure drops, and this mass is flowing so fast through the orifice of the valve that it actually gets below vapor pressure. So we know from thermodynamics, if we lower the pressure, we can lower the temperature and we start boiling. So as we're going through the valve, the water starts boiling and it makes these bubbles and this is has a, a lot of energy so we put a lot of energy in that small area accelerating it through there and when you come out of the vena contracta and you start deaccelerating and you bring your pressure back up in your pipe then this pressure collapses these bubbles from the back it's called a microjet and so the bubbles actually implode on themselves from the back and shoot out the front as a microjet hit your metal and actually melt the metal away and so these bubbles become hot as the sun and uh, it, it, they'll actually and they have PSI up in a hundred thousand PSI and maybe three thousand K of temperature you, you can get way up there it gets as hot as the sun now this is just like a bomb so it sends out a shock wave of maybe up to a hundred thousand PSI and when these uh, little micro jets are imploding uh, it sounds like gravel, like gravel's running through your valve, and that's how you can tell if there's uh, cavitation in your valve. And you erode, so your metal's eroding in your valve, and your what they call the globe, the little stem part that goes down to seal it off. Uh, we call this the globe, and it sits on the seat, so your globe uh, plunger will actually just erode away. So we'll learn how to size valves in our instrumentation on valve sizing. But I just wanted to bring up what CV was, and remember that you can't get 100% of your CV. That CV curve always flattens out, and again, when we lower our flow rate, our pressure increases, so it wants to flow faster, and we have to close the valve down more. And when we open the valve, our pressure wants to drop, so we lose CV, and we have to open the valve a little more, and we just can't get any more flow out of the valve. Okay. So remember, you can use 100% of the valve if you have the delta P. If you've calculated for that amount of delta P, and it's in the system. But most installations have uh, a normal operating range, and then you're trying to correct for upsets. So as you speed up, you'll tend to run out of differential pressure. And this is what I'm talking about. You'll tend to choke and run out of differential pressure as you speed up for an upset, so be careful. So if we were sizing a valve for a real plant, we'd probably have an operating of say uh, 800 gallons per minute, and then we'd want to increase 20% and go below 20% for upsets. So we'd have a high flow, a low flow, and a normal operating condition. And as you know, when we speed up, if we speed up our flow in our pipe very much at all, we have a tremendous head drop across that pipe and so that differential pressure will go away from the valve and this is exactly what I'm talking about you can actually get enough uh, pressure drop that you can bottleneck and choke yourself up and you just won't get the flow you're expecting through there so be careful about this uh, I'll try to talk about this more when we size valves okay okay so quickly let's size a pump uh, we have 100 gallons of water flowing through 100 foot of 2 inch schedule 40 pipe with an ID of 2.067 inches at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. That gives us a viscosity and centistokes of 1.22. The pump is producing 100 feet of water or 43.32 psi. When the pump is running at full speed, and the pipe is blocked by the valve at the exit end of the pipe, the pressure of 100 feet head is distributed evenly throughout the pipe. So, as you remember, we said at Pascal's Law that the pressure is the same everywhere in the pipe when it's a closed system. So, if we crack this valve open and the water starts flowing at 100 gallons per minute, uh, we're going to calculate what the parameters are. And so, first of all, 
uh, we'll get our velocity. What is the velocity of our fluid? Formula we've already used, gallons per minute times 0 0.4085 divided by the inches squared of the pipe diameter inside, and we get our velocity of 9.56 feet per second. So we have a good velocity here with the two inch pipe. Uh, next, we find the Reynolds number, and this tells us how turbulent the flow is. And so the Reynolds number, we'll use the formula out of the book, 3160 times the flow rate in gallons per minute times the specific gravity divided by the pipe ID in inches and the viscosity in centistokes. And so we get a Reynolds number of 125,310. Now, all we have to do is put this into the Moody friction factor equation. So we did this earlier uh, for you, but we'll do it again. Uh, we did this in math. If we plug in all of our numbers and our Reynolds number is 125,310, uh, we divide that. We're using 0.00015E, the absolute roughness of the pipe. And this is a new installation of pipe. Uh, our diameter here in inches is 2067 inches, and when we calculate it, we get a friction factor of 0 0.0217. Okay, now we have to calculate our head loss. So to calculate our head loss, we use the darcy Weisbach equation, and our head loss will equal the friction factor times the length in feet divided by the pipe ID in feet, so we multiply by 1 over 12. The 12 comes to the top. And so we get this formula. Uh, we've gone through this already in math. So we get the head loss equals our friction factor times our length in feet times 12 divided by the pipe ID in inches times the velocity squared in feet per second divided by 64, 2G. So we put our friction factor in there of 0 0.0217. We have 100 foot of pipe. Our pipe ID is 2.067. We multiply that times our velocity of 9.56 feet per second, and we square that. We divide it by 64, and we get 17.99 feet of head loss across this pipe. So uh, we're going to put a valve in here, and your valve is typically going to be 10% to 40% of the head loss of the piping system. So we'll increase the head loss on our piping system by 40%. We'll take 40% and increase our pump head by that much. So if we take 18 feet ahead across the piping times 0.4, 40%, that equals 7.196 feet of head for the valve sizing calculation. Okay, so we got 18 feet ahead plus we got seven feet ahead across the valve, and that's 25 feet. So that leaves us 75 feet to overcome pressure in a vessel uh, and work. So obviously this pump's a little big, but um, it may be for future expansion. You may be planning on adding some more system later on, so you may oversize your pump. Uh, you just have to burn up all that differential pressure across the valve until you add the addition to the system. Okay, remember we had an extra 75 feet, and this would be perfect for what we talked about earlier, uh, going into a pressurized column like we talked about earlier. So 75 feet divided by 2.31 feet per PSI gives us 32.46 PSI. So if we had 30 PSI steam or vapor in this vessel, uh, this pump will be perfect to pump into this vessel. Okay, uh, some sample exam questions. Uh, on the CSE exam, uh, and you could find this on the CCST too as well, uh, it'll say, uh, we've got a hydrostatic tower that provides water to a town. And uh, the top of the tower is at 75 feet full of water. And we have a transmitter five foot off the ground. And then they'll ask on the transmitter, what is the reading? And they may say, what is it in PSI? And what is it in inches of water? So 
the height we're going to be reading on the transmitter is the difference in the height. So we just take 75 feet to the top minus 5 feet off the ground, and that gives us a difference of 70 feet. And then we have 70 feet divided by 2.31 feet per PSI equals 30.3 PSI G gauge. Now, notice on right here, PSI equals feet times specific gravity divided by 2.31. That's 2.31 feet per PSI. So the feet cancel out and the PSI comes to the top. And specific gravity has no units. So we know that we need a PSIG gauge that will handle at least 30.3 PSIG on the transmitter. Now, if they ask what it is in inches of water, we would take 70 feet and we multiply our feet times 12 inches. And that turns us into inches. And that's 12 inches per foot. So the feet cancel out. You're left with inches. And we get 840 inches of H2O. Well, they probably won't ask this, but if they say what kind of transmitter would you use on it, uh, it depends on what they're asking. But if we were using a Rosemont 3051, we'd use a, a gauge pressure transmitter. And if they were asking what size it would be, you would have to pick a range that has at least 840 inches of H2O. So like with a Rosemont, a range 3 would have plus minus 1,000 inches and that would be big enough. Okay. Now, you may uh, have a question on pressure and head with a pump and process lines. So, in this question here, it says, a process pump produces 100 feet of head, and a fluid with a specific gravity of 0 0.80 enters the pump. If the inlet gauge reads 100 PSIG, what does the outlet gauge read in PSIG? Well, this is not as intuitive because it's specific gravity. And like we said before, if it's 0.8, it's lighter than water. And it's just like you can push a concrete block across the table, and then you can push a styrofoam block across the table. So it doesn't take as much energy to push the styrofoam block. So when you put that same amount of energy in, the styrofoam block goes a lot further because it's lighter. So since we have a lighter fluid and the pump is typically sized in water, uh, since the fluid is lighter, it can lift it higher. And this is very important. You need to understand this concept. It's the same thing that happens in flow. Uh, since it's lighter, you can lift it higher. But since this is a pump and we're produced, it says, what's the PSI? That means we divide, just like in our orifice calculations and our valve calculations, we divide our pressure by the specific gravity to correct for height. So this 100 feet would get divided by 0.8, and that makes it 125 feet. In other words, 125 feet of this process fluid produces the same weight at the bottom as 100 feet of water. So since we're trying to produce the same pounds per square inch on the bottom, we have to raise the slider fluid up higher to get the same force on the bottom, the same amount of weight. Remember, the pump's doing the same amount of work. No matter what kind of fluid, it puts that many foot-pounds of work into the fluid. And since it's lighter, it goes further for the same amount of foot-pounds per work of the motor. So this process fluid becomes 125 feet of process head. And then again, just like we did with the hydrostatic tower, we'll take 125 feet and divide that by 2.31 feet per PSI and we get 54.11 PSI. Now all we have to do is take our inlet pressure, add our pump pressure to it, and that gives us 154.11 PSI on the discharge pressure gauge. Okay, let's take a look at all these principles put together on the simulator, and that way we can see water actually moving, you know, make a little more sense, I hope. Uh, I know this is a long video, but uh, we got about 15 minutes when we go through the simulator. I think it's worth it. I hope you get a lot out of it.
Uh, in this lesson, we're going to teach about head and energy and kinetic and potential and energy grade. Right now, we're filling up this tank with fluid from our pump. And our pump uh, endows energy by accelerating the water. It does this by a vein that's curved. And as it turns, it actually turns backwards like a highlight, and it slings the water. And as it slings the water, it accelerates it. And acceleration times mass equals force. So the pump endows force onto the water. This force is what forces the water to rise to a height. By generating force, we can force the water to accelerate upward. We're actually always accelerating the water upward into a column of water with the pump. That's its whole purpose. As we fill up this tank, we'll notice that this height right here is increasing. That's because we're adding potential energy. I'm increasing the height a little higher. We're doing it rapidly now. Increasing the height very quickly. Very qu Watch the columns of water in the tubes and you'll see how they rise with potential. That's because we're building up more force and it's storing more energy. Okay, I'm back. Okay, so we've increased our height, which increased our energy storage. And by increasing the height, we've actually increased the weight of the water in here. Of course, weight is force. And force divided by area is pressure. And this is what people like to talk about pressure, but I want to get away from pressure and talk about head instead of pressure. By adding this weight and this force, we've taken the force, divided it by the mass, and we have acceleration. So this head of water is actually accelerating the water out of the tank and through the piping system. This piping system is just like an electrical circuit. Uh, these are resistors. The valve's resistor, the 90's are a resistor, the pipe is a resistor, this 90's a resistor, and behind here, behind, behind here, I actually have a little orifice. It's a, a small washer and it has a hole in it and this resistance acts like a long piece of pipe. That's why the water stands up here instead of being at zero going out because we know at the end of our run we have no energy left. We've used all of our energy. Going from maximum energy to zero energy. And just like in voltage, we can actually measure the energy dropped across the line. Just like you have a resistor and use watts to size your resistor, that's because it's dissipating energy and heat and vibration. This dissipates heat and energy and vibration. So we take this potential and we start doing work. Potential is the ability to do work. We start doing work and so this forces the water to accelerate through the pipe. Mass time acceleration equals force. And we get a voltage drop or a pressure drop across each one of these sections of fittings and pipe because the resistors, just like you measure a voltage drop across the resistor, we measure a potential. The potential in head is the same as the potential in voltage. It can be thought of the same thing. And we can see a difference of pressure across here or a difference of head and potential energy. So we have a difference of potential energy. Now we want to talk about our head uh, not as pressure, but in this notation we want to talk about head in feet and in inches and in millimeters and meters uh, because this height can be translated to PSI. We know that this is weight over an area and weight divided by area or force divided by area is pressure. Therefore pressure is pounds per square inch PSI. So we got to understand this is weight and this weight is the force which is doing the work. And we can calculate how much work is doing by the pounds per square inch. So 27.7 .7 inches of water equals one pound of water per square inch. If I took a one inch square column, and I took a one by one, I raised it 27 inches high, 27.7 .7 inches high, it would actually weigh one pound of force or weight. So that's how we can translate our height into PSI. So this difference in height is our velocity. Now we fall and our velocity equals the square root of 2gh. 
So this differential height is proportional to the velocity of the water flowing. The velocity times the area equals our volume. So by putting an orifice which has a precisionally drilled hole, we have an exact resistor here. This acts just like an electrical resistor, a precision resistor. And so we can measure the potential of energy across it, same as voltage. By measuring this difference of potential, we can tell how fast the water is flowing. And just like you have a voltage meter and you have a resistor, you can tell what the current flow is. We can tell what the water flow is. So our potential, you see we're up here. You would think it would squirt out, only if you block off the end. So as the height gets higher, the faster it flows, the more potential we have and the more the kinetic energy is required to drop it. So when you have more potential to provide more kinetic energy and a higher force, it's a higher differential force, so it causes it to accelerate through the pipe faster. Okay, if I would put my finger behind this and block off this orifice a little bit, I'll deaccelerate this. This is the same principle as a control valve. And when we deaccelerate it, the potential energy will increase. So watch the potential energy increase. As I slow it down, potential energy increases, increases, increases. And well, we're real slow, so these are almost exactly even. There's only a quarter inch difference. They're almost even because it's almost to a standstill. Notice your height is increasing a little bit. It's increasing a little bit. It's increasing a little bit. It's increasing a little bit. Now, I'll move my finger away from it. We'll see the potential energy change in kinetic. It starts accelerating faster, and the tank will start falling. And it slowly falls down. So, this, is, this can be understood as resistors, and this valve and these 90s are a resistor, and this orifice is a resistor, and this piece of pipe is a resistor, and this orifice back here is a resistor. And we take the potential energy, it's the difference of potential, just like voltage. And so we can see our potential is the ability to do work. Okay, one last thing is, uh, we're going to talk about the difference of pressure and head. Uh, when we're talking about piping systems, we're putting a gauge on it. The gauge will be in PSI, pounds per square inch. Uh, that's because it doesn't matter if it's water or gas or alcohol or oil. It's just molecules and pinging in the side of the pipe. And they're just bouncing on the side of the pipes. And as these molecules and ping the side, they're actually pounding on it like a hammer. And this generates a force. And force divided by area is pounds per square inch. And this pounds per square inch will tell us when the pipe's going to rupture or when the gas is going to rupture. So it's easy to talk about PSI, so our gauges will typically be in PSI and not feet. Uh, when we talk about feet, we'll use the feet to measure the height in the tank. So we'll take the pressure, convert the feet, because that's exactly what we want to measure, is how much feet of water we have, it's potential energy. Now when we're sizing our orifices and our valves, uh, again, we're talking about feet or inches of water. On an orifice, we'll typically talk about the formula in inches of water, and in a valve, we'll talk about PSI because it's a convenient unit for the piping system. The piping system is designed in PSI, so we'll size our valve in PSI because typically it's 15 to 40 percent of the pressure drop across the pipe. We take that and add 40 percent, 15 to 40 percent across our valve to make it function above and beyond the piping system. And again, we'll take the square root of the orifice and the square root in the valve. We take the square root because velocity equals square root of 2gh. And of course, we're looking at the difference of height, the difference of force, so it causes it to accelerate. And we translate this square root of 2g, two times acceleration of gravity, into our coefficient for the valve or the orifice. Pumps are sized in feet of head times pounds, or foot pounds of work. We have orifices to measure our flow. And we have valves, which are variable orifices, that control our flow. And these are based on the weight of the fluid. Our weight of the fluid equals our uh, density compared to the density of water. And this is a ratio. So it's either heavier than water or lighter than water. And this is based on weight. And this weight, as you saw, is proportional to the height of the column. So the height of the column times the specific gravity equals the height of if it was water. 
In other words, uh, if it's an alcohol and it's 0.78, it will only be 78% of the height if it were water. So remember, specific gravity is the weight per volume of a liquid over the weight per volume of water. And with gases, it's the gas or vapor weight per volume over air weight per volume. And these have to be referenced to standard references so everybody has the same uh, reference. So water and gas will typically be 6 degrees Fahrenheit and 14.7 PSIA. So make sure that it's 60 or 68 degrees or whatever reference you're using. There's multiple references out there for standards. Okay, that's it. We're done. We're out of here. Thanks for hanging in there. Bye.